What's up, this is Jacques and I'm a serial entrepreneur and college professor. Today we're gonna to talk about business. And look, while it's good to have a business that you're passionate about, which is amazing because that's what you use to help you keep going, your business also has to make money, like real money, like vacation taking, health insurance having, like real type of money. And to do that, you gotta have a proper monetization plan. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. But before we get into that, let me tell you a little bit about myself. As I said earlier, I'm a serial entrepreneur, which basically means I have a problem. I launch way too many companies. Over the last 10 years, I've launched over 15 different companies. And fortunately, some of them actually made it. One company was sold in 2017. Some companies, we just said, all right, P2. And today, we have four plus companies that we're actively running. And I want to tell you a little bit more about those companies. Most of those companies that fit within the marketing industry, so one of them is a company called uh, Shade, where we manage and represent black and brown influencers. So on one hand, we work with those creators as their agent and brands like uh, Nike, Coca-Cola, whatever, reach out to us in hopes of reaching those creators. We're sort of that middleman person, right? But companies also come to us and say, look, Jacques, we want to influence black culture. We want to do it through your firm and we kind of facilitate that relationship. So that's our company, Shade. We have a company called Nappy which is a stock photo website full, uh, filled with photos of black and brown people. We launched that company because we're in media and we know that the work that we do impacts the, the greater world. We choose which photos go on magazines. We choose what goes on billboards or goes on ads. But with that, we also know that other folks in marketing and media also do, does that same choosing. But photos of us and photos of a real us, they're not really out there. Right. You go to free stock photo sites, you type in coffee, you don't see photos of us drinking coffee. But I don't know about you, but I drink coffee. So we launched an app to be able to show more photos of people like us drinking coffee, having time with their kids, being in love, et cetera, et cetera, and et cetera. So Nappy launched in 2017. And since then, the website has had a um, over 200. Our photos have seen, been seen over 220 million times downloaded. Um, over 80 million times. And I mean, I got to look at the numbers, but uh, we've had some real successes, which shows us that this is a need that folks really need. So our next company is a company called Snappy, short for Snappy Booth. Snappy is a photo booth company for brands, brand activations, brand events, uh, influencer events, launch events, whatever sort of events companies have. They reach out to us and say, hey, look, we need experiences within our events. And we provide them with our photo booth. This is actually one of our booths right here. And we have a few others. We have three types of booths and we work in all, you know, all around the US um, helping brands uh, like Tiffany, the ring company, uh, Burger Kings and the rest of them reach out to us for that service. Uh, we also have a, another company called Boogie. Boogie, which initially was a marketing agency is now a consulting company where strictly brands come to us and they say, look, we need you to do research on a particular segment, segment specifically relating to Black culture. Say a brand wants to launch a product and they want research to see if Black women would actually respond well to it. Stuff like that, that's what our firm does. And in the list of a bunch of other things, Shade itself has its own subdivision companies, Shade Books, Shade TV, Shade Speakers, a bunch of other companies. We've also launched Fab Studio and the list goes on. Um, I don't want to bore you, but essentially uh, being a serial entrepreneur, I get the privilege of being in different parts of business and also being in a bunch of different types of businesses from service businesses to product based businesses. So today we're going to talk about some monetization profit and revenue, which are probably one of, you know, if you add on add an expense to that, these are the only three words you really need to understand about business right revenue is the money that comes in profit is after you take care of everything you need to take care of whatever is left. Right. So if I make 10, but I got to pay two dollars here and five dollars there, there's five left. My profit is five. We already spoke about profit, but you can take it a step even further now and separate it to gross and net profit. What gross profit is, is basically your profit after removing the cost that it takes you to deliver whatever it is you're delivering. And your net profit is the money that actually comes to your pocket. Let me break it down. So if I'm selling this hoodie, right? I'm selling this hoodie for $50. This is how much I'm, I'm selling it for. Whatever, if somebody pays it, that's my revenue, right? But I'm paying $15 to get this hoodie made. So my gross profit 
after this, I get this hoodie, it's $35, right? Because 50 minus 15. And then, and then, right, you take into account the Google or Facebook ad that I spent $5 on to get the customer. My office or whatever, let's say all that stuff, I can say I spent an additional $15 of that money to, you know, part of that, the hoodie is paying $15 of the rest of those expenses. Then in that case, 35 minus 15 brings us down to 20. So in that case, for this particular hoodie, my gross profit is 35 and my net profit is 20. For what are the different types of business models? So what are the different types of business models, right? And, and there are tons of them. You know, we see them every single day. You have companies like Facebook that employs sort of that advertising business model, right? They give you free product and they make their money from the actual um, advertisers who are paying to, you, to use the service. You have the SaaS software as a service indus uh, industry, which is something like a Netflix, right? Where you're paying to get access to this content and you're paying per month, right? Um, you have companies uh, like Amazon, which is straight commerce. You buy, you know, e-commerce, you pay a certain money, you get something back. So there are tons of business models out there and each of our different companies uses one or the other. You know, for the most part, most of our businesses are in the service space, meaning companies pay us money and we give them, a, we ran a certain service and we get paid for that service. That's a very traditional kind of cut and dry business model very similar to your tailor or whoever, right? They're in, the, in, the, in that industry. But we do have some companies that has other models like Nappy, for example, we have two monetization plans and one of them is the advertising. So we have a relationship with an advertiser that owns our search page. So if you're searching for a photo and let's say we only have 10 results of that and out of those 10, none of them fit what you're looking for, you're also going to see five more results under that, which are sponsored results. There will be same results from whatever you search for, but they're going to go to that partner's website. And if you click it and you buy it, we get a percentage of whatever that sale is. What are some of the different types of ways you can monetize? Now, monetization is a very important word. We spoke about it earlier and I said, this is what we're going to be talking about. Monetization is the most important part of business because without money, you can't succeed. Cash is oxygen. You need a monetization plan to make money so that your business could be here for long, right? So in, in, within our businesses, we have a bunch of different types of monetization plans. You know, I mentioned earlier that Nappy has um, the advertisement, right? Where uh, an advertiser owns our search page. Excuse me. Um, our company's, uh, you know, shade is, is a very sort of service-based thing where companies just pay us a certain amount of money and we render a certain service. But I, 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 I do want to break down a little bit sort of how we do it for each of our branches to give you a sense of how we make money and also keeping in mind gross profit and net profit, all right? So for example, let's look at Shade, which is an influencer management agency. So how those businesses work, essentially you are the agent of an influencer or the talent and you represent that talent. The brand comes to you and say, hey, we need to work with that talent. You negotiate that deal and normally how you get paid is you get a percentage of that deal. So essentially, if I am working with a talent and I'm, I'm, I'm negotiating for them to get a project that's worth 10K, based on our relationship, they get the 10K and I get 20% of that 10K that I'm able to bring them. So that is how a lot of talent agencies do their monetization, which is they take a piece of the talent themselves. Some agencies like ourselves also charge the brand another fee for other services as well. So for example, for us in that case, we do the percentage that we take from the creator, but we also, for our consulting and us managing a project, we also have a separate fee that we charge the brand themselves, right? So in this particular business, we have multiple streams of, of monetization coming in within just one particular project. You know, but for Nappy, a lot of people would think about how do you monetize something like that? The easy, obvious way is these are photos, you charge for those photos. Or maybe you do a freemium model where it's free, but if you subscribe to Nappy, you're going to get exclusive access or whatever. But that goes 100% against our mission, which is to make these beautiful, gorgeous photos of black and brown people accessible for 100% free. So because of that, what we decided to do was, one, we, I mentioned the advertiser monetization plan. But the second thing is we've decided to turn it into somewhat of a service-based business as well. So we launched a new plan called Nappy Studio. And what Nappy Studio is, it's a way for literally every single person within the company to win. 
So what it is, is there are brands that go to a website and they see a photo of a guy. Maybe they see a photo of me with my hoodie and my locks and they're like, yo, this is a dope shop, but I would love it if he was to maybe looking over there or something very specific. So with Nappy Studio, they can actually commission branded photos through us. So they come and say, hey, we're looking for photos and our package, it looks like this. The brand will get 20 high quality photos of a black or brown person. We will shoot the content, meaning we will work with our nappy photographers and pay them. So they're getting paid now for being a part of our, our community. So we work with our nappy photographers to pay them. We cast the models. So now models, black and brown models are also being paid now. And the brand pays for the whole thing. So we cast the model, we do the shoot, we send the brand about 40 photos. They look through it, pick their top 20. We get it edited and then the brand gets the photo. But how does this all fulfill the mission? Well, the brand gets a, a huge discount on the photos. So what they're paying is $5,000 for 20 photos for a service that normally a photography company would potentially charge 15K and up. But it's because we're not charging them a licensing fee. Why aren't we charging them a licensing fee? The brand is going to get the photos and they have exclusive license for three months to do whatever they want to do with the photos. But at the end of the three month time, that license will expire and it will the photos now will become nappy property. And it will just be on our website and be available for everybody in the world to use. The brand will still be able to use it, but it's also available for everybody else. So what it does is it helps us fulfill our mission of improving black and brown uh, folks lives through representation by bringing more photos to our library it's providing very high quality photos at an affordable rate for the brand. It's paying photographers, it's paying models and everybody's happy. And it's also giving us money because with that model that I just mentioned, and we're talking about gross profit and, and net profit, our gross profit for that project is $4,000. So our cost to deliver that for the brand is about $1,000 from paying photographers and models and um, paying lunch for the day. And then we have $4,000 as a company that we then take inside and say, all right, let's pay the likes, let's pay the whatever, let's pay the whatever to then determine what a net profit is. So let's talk about why it's so hard for new entrepreneurs, specifically new black entrepreneurs to monetize their businesses. There are hundreds of reasons. There are tons of them. One of them is that a lot of times we don't even know how much we could make for certain things, right? Information is so scarce and folks is, you know, they keeps things so close to the vest. We don't even know how much we can even charge for certain things, right? So that's the first thing. Um, secondly, the last 400 years, I don't know about you, but it hasn't been pretty easy for us. So coming out here and now starting to own businesses, we have a lot of insecurities we're dealing through. We have a lot of things where like, you may see something and you may think you could charge a thousand dollars for it, but there's little, that little voice in your head that says, man, you can't get 200 for this. And you go and charge 150 or something like that, right? So there's a big conversation in a general entrepreneur and creative and industry about increasing your prices. But I think it's even harder for black founders because I mean, when you're born in a country where the first thing you learn in history is that you used to be three fifths of a person that mess up with your confidence and your ability to come in a room like, yo, I own it. Right. But also there's that lack of having mentors and folks that look like you to tell you to actually give you gain and tell you how it is and how much they're charging. You need folks like me saying, for shade, we have a minimum chart, minimum minimum uh, campaign price of 50K. For you to know like, oh crap, I, I could charge 50K. That's a thing that's available to me, right? So, but in addition to all that mental stuff, there's also just the lack of business experience. You know, a lot of us don't have it. Not all of us went to MBA or got our MBAs or went to business school. So it's, there's also just a lack of knowing. And, you know, you see businesses online all the time and you think they're successful, but they themselves are not really monetizing, right? And so what I want to make sure that you walk away from this remembering is that you need money. Cash is oxygen when it comes to business. You can have the best business in the world that takes care of, you know, feeds all the whatevers of the world. But if it's not making some sort of money, whether that is through the donation, that's another monetization plan if you're a nonprofit or something like that, right? If it's not making money through donation, selling products, a service or whatever, it's not going to last. And here's the thing. This is how I want you to think about it. It's actually selfish to not monetize your company. Why? Because you build this dope business that's going to make a huge difference to your brothers, sisters, cousins, whoever, right? And by having this business now, like say like myself, you can employ 
black and brown folks. You can educate, right? But you're not charging enough. You're not monetizing. And as a result, this business is not going to last another six months. So by charging money and by monetizing, you're making sure that you're going to exist to continue doing the great work that you're doing. So make sure you do the research. Google is free. Do the Googles. Do whatever you need to do. Uh, and try to find out what is the right monetization plans for you. Watch this video over and over. Watch the previous videos on different monetization th plans out there. Google different things. We need to come correct. The biggest one I've seen is not actually establishing product market fit. And what that means is basically you have not had a, any proof that your business actually works. Simple as that, right? You don't have proof that it actually works. So what does that mean? A company like Facebook their business is based on us human beings being on the platform. They know that that works because we spent years being on the platform even before they started making money, right? Because at first they were just raising money. So they have product market fit with the audience and then they now can tell their advertisers, hey, bro, X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z. On the flip side, you have a company like uh, Quibi, which is a social uh a Netflix competitor, if you will, that launched, raised $2 billion and went out of business in six months and like shutting down and everything. It's because they ran, right? They never stopped and really try to figure out, let's make sure everything fit. The customer loves the product, that this loves the that, this works well and everything works together, right? Like for us, when it comes to what our, our, our monetization plans for all of our companies, if we're looking at Nappy, for example, people are going to keep coming to our website. You know, the 10,000 plus that visits our website on a day-to-day -day basis, as long as our photo, our product continue to be free as they expect it to be, they're not going to change, right? So we can confirm that that's going to work. So that's cool. We can keep it there. So for the advertising business that we have, we know that business is going to work because we can guarantee that the people are going to come. Now, if we try to be greedy and say, you know what, we're going to do two things. We're going to do advertisement and a subscription basis where like folks are going to have to subscribe to see our photos now. And when they subscribe, that's when they're going to get to the nappy, uh, get to the, the advertisers, right? Then you're going to see what a reduction, you know, maybe 90% of people stop coming to the site because only 10% convert and actually become a subscription customer. And I'm saying 10, like that, that's very unlikely, right? It's more like close to 1%. So now you're making subscription money, but let's say it's not enough to cover your bases. You may say, well, I have the advertising money, right? wrong because now you have 99% less people coming to the site. They're not going to be incentivized to go with you. So you have to make sure that everything works, right? And then the final thing is once all said is done, once you get, you know, your gross profit and you start looking at your internal stuff, you need to make sure that your gross profit is able to take care of all your stuff and you still have net profit left because you can have a great gross profit here. But if you, your expenses, yeah, I got to pay him, pay employee, this pay office, that pay whatever. And at the end, you left with negative ten dollars, or you're making just enough money to, you know, to buy gum. It's not going to work out in the long run. So that's the mistake I see: is really not perfecting that kind of product market fit, making sure that the customer, the user, everybody who needs all the stakeholders in that particular company or product, everything works together in harmony the way that it's supposed to. So, how does your pricing model affect your customer acquisition strategy, right? Now, that's a whole other thing, right? Now we're talking about marketing. Now we're talking about how to get folks through the door. Um, but it, it, it affects it because based on the price point of who you're trying to reach, it will tell you which methods make more sense. So, for example, if you are a B2C company, you're going after consumers, folks who are spending under $100 for whatever you're doing, there's a particular method, there's a particular customer acquisition strategy you can employ. You, you know, you can do your Facebook ads. You can do a lot of those things so they make more sense. But... If you're going after B2B clients who are larger companies that are spending much more money, right? They're spending a couple thousand on whatever it is you're selling. They, the, the, the customer acquisition process is very different because then you may have to do more educating, more showing them that you're an expert before they make that investment, which then could say, maybe you could employ a webinar strategy or a, a, content, a, a content strategy where you're releasing eBooks or whatever, right? So based on who you're trying to reach, you will determine one, what's the best place to reach them and what's the best method to communicate to them, right? Because everybody has a certain thing they need to go through. If you're if you're Fashion Nova, you feel me? Like, I just need to see a photo of somebody looking fly in this hoodie. I'm like, ah, right, yeah, cool, works for me, right? But if it's something bigger, right? If you're trying to, if you're selling a company, a 
thousand dollar printer, then it's not just about seeing the photo of the printer. Maybe I need to have a webinar where I demo the printer. I need to bring it to you and show it to you, right? So based on your pricing strategy, based on the product, based on everything, will then help you determine what is the best customer acquisition strategy you need to employ. What is a sales funnel and what are the key steps needed to build a successful funnel, right? Well, to do it, let me, let me, let me show it to you right quick. So sales funnel, right? It looks something like this. So you have a business, right? And I, like I mentioned earlier, you have to take uh, certain customers need to see certain things, right? So imagine uh, we're looking at, you know, the fashion Nova example earlier, your funnel is basically the journey you take the customer through until you get the sell. So for example, let's say your end goal here is where you get the sell is the checkout page, right? And this is the customer, this is a nice customer, pretty, whatever, all right? So this is the customer, wh what journey do you have to take them through to get them, right? So we're talking about this, this is a B2C. So for something like Fashion Nova, what it could look like is they may have to first show the customer an ad, right? And from that ad, it takes them through Fashion Nova's website, right? And then from there, it could be as simple as that, and then they just go and buy, right? So very simple three-step funnel. But let's say it's a B2C company. I'll give you an example, say something like for our company Shade, it, it goes something more like this, right? So we, we'll make it start the same way with an ad, the same way, right? So this is it, and this is the end goal where they pay us. So we'll start with the ad. So they see an ad, but this ad, instead of going to our website, this ad takes him to an ebook, right? It's an ebook that we send them that helps educate them a little bit, right? We just wanna confirm that they know the, the subject, but also they know us as the experts that teaches this particular subject or that, that does work within that space, right? So in this case, they get this ebook and at the end of the ebook, there's a, a link that says, hey, um, grab our calendar, whatever, right? And let's schedule a call. So schedule call, whatever. I write much nicer in a row, row paper anyways. Anyways, so you schedule a call and then within that call, let's say there's a proposal that happens and then, and then whatever, it finally leads to the sale. So this is a much longer uh, funnel that you take the customer through, right? But a third example I can give you is something else. I have a, a program called Creative Freedom, which is a program where I teach creatives how to build their own creative agency. And this is this funnel that I take them through, right? So same way, first, you know, they see an ad. And I know a lot of these funnels are starting with ads, but they don't have to. Some of them could start with um, other different things, maybe a reach out, maybe whatever, right? So in our case, they first see an ad. And then what it takes them to is a page where they watch a presentation. It's an hour long presentation where I ex basically explain to them and I teach them, you know, how to increase their prices. So they're watching this presentation. And in there, I'm saying very specific things. They're learning from me. They're getting a sense of who I am. They're getting my personality. They're like, okay, this is, a, you know, seems like a cool dude and I like his hair and everything, right? So they're, they, they, they're getting that. And then at the end, I may say, hey, um, I actually have a course that teaches this stuff, right? You want this? And then they, you know, they, they could say yes, but there are folks who may not necessarily buy, right? So those same people here, if they don't buy here, I also add them to my mailing list. So then they get emails from me after they sign up. They get emails on day one. They get emails on day three, emails day seven. The list goes on all the way to about day 18. And throughout all these emails, this is me just basically continue giving them value for free, right? Because the investment for this program is $1,000. So it's not just like Fashion Nova where you just see an ad and you just spend the money. So I'm gonna have to show you, this is the right program for you. You're making an investment, I'm the right teacher for you, right? So I gotta take them through this entire process to then get them to finally from maybe, maybe it's email 15 that gets them. They go, you know what, here, take my money, Jacques. And there are also instances where even after email 18, they don't buy and that's cool, right? Cause that's business. But this is essentially a funnel. So when you're building your own funnel, what you do is you basically say, okay, let me break down what process, right? How do, what journey I need to take my customers through from when they first find out about me to money in the bank, getting money, cash money. 
Now, that answer is going to depend on the kind of business you're in, right? If you are a straight up product business, I'm selling X, Y, and Z product. I mean, you're monetizing off jump, right? You're straight up out the gate. Like, this is my thing. This is my hoodie. I, you know, charge, I, you know, I sell it for $50 or whatever. If you are a service-based business, again, you're also charging from jump, but some people may do certain things for free to start building their name up, whatever. That's a different combo, right? So I think in this case, we're, we're probably mostly speaking about software as a service type of businesses or subscription businesses where, you know, a company like Nappy that was not making money on day one, right? So we eventually started monetizing later on. Um, I'd like to think we took too long to monetize. You know, we started monetizing about a year and change into it, which means all that money was being paid by us. And, but when we said, okay, server is adding up, this is adding up, we want to do more, we want to be able to post our own photo shoots or whatever, then we said, right, we got to monetize so we can then have money to do things with. But to me, you got to start monetizing from jump, even if it's not publicly out there, even if it's not, you know, on your website immediately, there's a way to pay. You need to start thinking about monetization even when, even before you launch whatever it is you're launching. I think because at the end of the day, cash is oxygen. And if you don't think about how to, how you're going to survive as a business, it's going to fail. So then how do you, how do you actually determine how much to, to price? That's a very, that's, that's a, that's a weird one. I say weird because there's so many uh, things that comes with it, right? Like you think about this hoodie, you know, I say, I've been saying $50 this whole time. But there are folks that could charge $300 for this hoodie. And there are folks that could charge 15 max for this hoodie because of their brand, right? So like you, it's, it's really difficult because in the case of a B2C business, it really determine, it really depends on how does the, the customer perceive your brand and what are they willing to spend, right? Uh, you know, on a, you know, a Yeezy, for example, and it's, I don't know if Kanye, I don't know if Kanye is canceled or not, but either way. So a Yeezy example, right? For whatever reason, folks are willing to spend three hundred dollars on a T-shirt with holes all over it, right? Because that's the brand. Folks are willing to drop a couple hundred dollars on Jordans because that's the brand, right? So it's not an easy, clear-cut. This is how much you should charge in terms of how to determine your pricing, right? So then the best way to do it is research. Is to look at okay, what are folks out there charging? What are folks like me that are in my same space, you know, as new as me or have the similar brand equity as me, what are they charging? Trying to get a sense of those things to, to use that to gauge how much you should come into the market with, right? But also keeping in mind your actual bills, keeping in mind what makes sense. So for example, let's say you're in a business where, you know, I'm hypothetical, but if you're in a business where you are, whatever it is that you're doing, you can only do 10 of it per day, max. 10 of it per day is the max you can do, whatever business you're in. And your competitors or folks around you are charging $10 for said thing, right? So if you came in at their exact price, right, you're, you're potentially doing $100 a day. And then now keep that in mind and look at your expenses and your bills and everything. If $100 a day at the end of the, at the, end of the month and year could work for you, it, keeping in mind that nobody's going to be busy and have clients 24-7, but just if you start thinking about that kind of model, if the numbers don't make sense, then that business doesn't make sense. That business model doesn't make sense. It's not going to make money, right? So you start thinking about, well, in that case, how do I tweak it up? How do I, is there something I could do where that could allow me to charge 200, uh, make, make 200 a day without spending the same 10 hours, right? So in the list goes on, or can I hire folks where I'm paying them a small amount, right? Which is, um, you know, keeping in mind, uh, I'm paying them a certain amount of money, but then it's allowing me to do more per day, which at the end of the day, Whatever. There's a lot of stuff you got to consider, but I just want you to keep in mind that make sure that you have a thought for monetization prior to launching, because there are a lot of beautiful, amazing companies that have launched that we have set RIPs to. You know, I mean, one of them could be Quibi, but it's because they didn't think monetization all the way through. They launched a product that folks love, but the money just doesn't never made sense. There's not enough people to pay you and the amount of money you'd have to charge for you to reach your numbers, folks are not willing to pay that money. We're also pretty conditioned, right? Like a Netflix is $8 and, you know, 12 if you're fancy, you don't want ads and whatever, right? 16 if you want the family joint. It's very difficult to come out the blue with a Netflix talking about $20, $20 a month. Not that folks don't have 20 a month, it's just the market has already decided that's the price range. So 
if you have a business model that you want to launch on Netflix, but for only for your numbers to work, Quibi is to charge fit 25, then that business just can't work, right? So that's that that's my take on say that kind of B2C world. Now, in the service-based business, again, it goes right back to that, um, you know, it really depends on who, what your brand is or who around you, right? And with, with the kind of subscription model business, you know, a lot of that has to do with see what competitors are paying. Um, but one thing I do want to stress is the importance of value as well, meaning charging folks based on the value that you bring to them. And this is where a lot of us creatives come in now, where why a photographer could charge $100 for something, another photographer could charge 10 k for the very same thing. So when you start pricing things by the value you bring in, then that's a different conversation. Then is where you don't do your pricing based on just how much you want to make. You do it based on, well, if I am selling you a computer, for example, I'm creating for you a computer that's going to allow you to make $500 a day, I'm going to charge you 10 k because in, in a month, you're going to make that. And after that, by the year, you're going to make 12 times that, right? I'm making this up, but you get the idea. So that's a different thing for a different question for, you know, different question and these different answers. But uh, that's how I would approach pricing, which is that just put it all together. There's not a clear cut. This is exactly how much it costs kind of way, right? It, it, certain industries dictate how much certain things cost. You look at the, the food industry, a McDonald's, Burger King, whatever, everything for the most part is under 10. You get the kind of specials are like five and six dollars. You get the dollar menu joints is like a dollar to two, but you can't really deviate too much from there because that's what the market understands, what the, that's what the market is willing to spend. So just make sure that your monetization plan makes sense all the way through and, you know, make sure it makes sense. C-E-N-T-E-S. Make sure it actually makes money so that you can continue building whatever it is you're building that's making the difference in the world that it needs to make. So let's talk about profit margin. How do you determine it? How do you increase it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Let's dig in, go to the iPad, and we'll talk about it. So your profit earlier, just to recap what I said, right? Your profit was your uh, revenue minus your expenses. So rev minus expense equals profit, right? But there's another way to look at this, right? Where we said you have your gross profit and your net profit. So your gross is your, your you know, so it's like revenue, minus cogs, which are essentially the cost of the goods that you're selling. So cost of goods sold equals gross profit and then minus expenses equals net profit, whatever, you get that idea, right? So now we understand everything about profit. So now once all is done, you have this thing, which is called your profit margin, right? So essentially, how do you determine it? So it varies. Some folks look at it based on the net profit. Some folks use mostly the gross profit, right? So in most of my cases, I normally use a gross profit as a number. So back to the hoodie, right? So, uh, and if you look at your um, your Shark Tank examples, like right? when, when you watch a Shark Tank pitch, a lot of times they're using a gross profit number. So they'll say how much is the cost you make and how much you charge for it, right? So in this case of the hoodie I mentioned, let's say I'm charging $50 for it. And I had mentioned earlier that it cost me 15 to make. So my COGS, which is my cost of goods sold, is $15. So that means that minus 15 equals 35. So I'm technically profiting $35 uh, from this particular hoodie. So then the, 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 the profit in it just becomes a, uh, a equation. Now I'm trying, I, I think the math is, if I'm not mistaken, uh, your profit margin percentage, if I'm not mistaken, it would be, 35 over 50, I think. Let's go to the calculator. So 35 over 50 times 100 is 70%, right? So in this case, profit margin is 70% on the product, right? Whereas if it costs me $25, then my profit would be 50%, right? So that's essentially how to calculate, which is you take the profit divided by the original number, which equals the margin, right? The percentage margin. So then the next question is, what's a good margin and what's a bad margin? Well, it really varies. It, it, it varies on the business, the industry, whatever. You have companies, you know, you may look at this 70, you say, oh, that's great. That's amazing, right? Well, companies, certain companies have much larger expense than others. 
So for me, our companies are pretty small in the context of like location and people and stuff. So we don't have a lot of expense here. So this margin, you know, I'll run with a gross profit, but folks who have a lot of expenses, they need a lot more gross profit to actually get a net profit at the end of the month or the whatever. So that means that let's look at example like uh, Beats headphones, for example, right? And these are not the actual numbers, but to give you an example, Beats headphones, they probably charge you 200, 250 or whatever, and they probably pay, right? Their expense is probably like $20 to make it. So then they're actually here, their gross profit in this case is like 180. And then you have their expenses. That means marketing. That means teams. That means uh, uh, product development and research. Whatever it means until the product finally gets to you, which who knows if based on their math, they're probably making, no lie, and I'm making this up, but they're probably making like $2 per headphones right? Which seems small to us, but when you do that and multiply by hundreds of thousands of millions, then you're like, okay, now I know how they make money, how they make profit. But this is similar to how most Fortune 500 companies are. So, but how do you get something where you're charging 200 and you make, you know, you, and you cost 20 for it? That's when folks go to other countries, right? That's when folks go to countries like China, where they're getting their product made somewhere else. For us, what's accessible to us, us regular people, you have websites like Alibaba, if you're selling a product where you can buy that product for $5, but the market value of it could actually be $50. So the same hoodie, I can buy it or get it printed for $5, $10. It's going to take me a little longer and I'm going to have to buy a little bit more up front, but I have much higher profit margin. So it brings us to the next question. Well, how do you increase your profit margin, right? And to do so, you increase your pricing, which is your revenue, or you decrease your cost. Simple as that. So going back to the simpler version of this equation, right? Which is revenue minus expense uh, equals profit. So we'll just do simple math. 100 minus uh, 50 is easy. Act like I know math. So minus 40 equals 60, right? So this is your profit. This is your expense. This is your revenue. If you want to increase profit, you do two things. You either decrease your expenses. So if you could find another supplier that could get the work done for $35, you now make 65 or you increase your prices. Hey guys, sorry to say, but we're gonna have to increase our prices to 120 and you keep your expenses the same, but now you're making $80 profit. So that's how you go about actually determining your profit margin. And here's also how you go about increasing uh, your profit margin as well. So what have I learned the most about monetization over the last 11 years of entrepreneurship? And what I've learned is that people have a lot more money than you think they do. And a lot of times we prevent ourselves from charging or charging a certain price, right? Because we think folks can't pay, right? This is the biggest mistake we make is that we charge people by our own wallet, right? What does that mean? We take our wallet, right? We think of what's in here. We know the significance of $100 or $200 or $500 for, to us. And we say, well, I wouldn't pay 200 for this hoodie. Why would I charge somebody else 200 from this hoodie, right? But what you need to understand is that everybody's in your situation. Maybe you, you're doing your thing in life and you could afford the 200, but maybe you're not, but other folks are. So don't be afraid to charge because folks got more money than you think they do. Folks got money in their savings, their 401ks. So don't be afraid to put numbers out there. Folks is dropping 50K for coaches to tell them what to do. And if it works, if it doesn't work. So folks got money. So if, so that's one of the things I learned, which is people got money. Don't be afraid to spend, I'm sorry, to spend. Don't be afraid to charge. The other thing I've also learned is that money is oxygen. Like it's like taboo, especially in the black community to talk about money, but you need to talk about money. You need it. It's literally the thing you need. Like you have to have a job, right? You got to have a job to pay your bills and take care of whatever you got to take care of. It's the same thing in your business. You need money. You need the money to be able to pay your team or build your team or whatever you need. Money is how you're going to get that freedom to do whatever it is that you want to do. So don't be afraid to monetize. Monetize early, right? Worst case, it doesn't work and you could try another monetization plan. So start sooner than later. Start right now. If you're watching this, go start monetizing your business right now today. And take everything I said, you know, I'm, I'm talking from, you know, 11 years of experience. I don't know everything, but I've made a lot of mistakes. And all of my answers I'm giving to you uh, in this program comes from the mistakes that I've made. 
Don't go make the same mistakes I made. Learn from them. When I tell you, like, don't charge by your wallet, because I used to charge by my wallet, right? When I tell you charge a lot of money for whatever you do, that's because I used to charge little money. And now I charge a lot of money and I realize, oh yeah, this is kind of cool, right? So take my advice and then go put go put in the work. 